In the previous video, I made an argument that the Maxwell equations have inherent within it an electromagnetic wave, and we worked out relationships between the strength and uh, the relative strength of the electric and magnetic fields, what the speed of the wave was, and saw that they point that the uh, that the fields point at right angles to each other. To help visualize wave propagation a bit more, there is a um, quantity called the pointing vector. And no, I did not misspell it. The person's name is John Henry Pointing, spelled with a Y. But you got to admit, he has probably about the most awesome name, because what his vector does is point in the direction of the propagation of the electromagnetic field. So here we have, whoops the electric and magnetic fields here, um, just from one quick snapshot of the wave propagation. And these will always be at right angles to each other and to the direction of propagation. So the direction of propagation itself will be like this. And this will be the direction of our pointing vector it is equal to, and I should actually use equal to here in this case, 1 over mu naught e cross b. And this does indeed point in the direction of propagation. So I'm going to attempt to draw a right hand here, making the special widget, and it's probably not going to go too well. But so if this is my thumb, and this is my index finger, and then this is my middle finger pointing out like that. And then I guess I got a couple more fingers hanging out there somewhere. And I suppose I should fit, fit. Okay. Oh man, that's bad. Okay. I tried just roll with it. Okay. Um, the, you, what you do is you put the electric field on the index finger of your right hand you put the magnetic field on the middle finger of your right hand and the pointing vector will point along your thumb. Okay. So beyond just the coolness that it points in the right direction, is there a physical interpretation we can give to it? We absolutely can. The magnitude of the pointing vector um, since these are at right angles, will just be the product of the two. So this will be E, B over mu naught. And since we know that the magnetic field is equal to the electric field over C, we could write this, for instance, as E squared over C mu naught. Now, why would I do that? It's because we saw that the energy stored in an electric field goes as the square of the electric field strength. Now I'm going to skip over some of the steps of the derivation, but this allows us to come up with a um, relation for the intensity of the wave. So we can say that the intensity of our light wave will be equal to power over the area. Now this is true at every instant in time, but the electric and magnetic fields oscillate so rapidly that only the most sensitive of detectors can actually see basically the flickering of the electromagnetic wave, if you will. So what we're usually more interested in is the average value of the intensity of the uh, wave. And because this is going as the square of a sine, um, the average, the time value, the time averaged value of sine squared is one half. I'll just quickly show that in a second here. So we pick up a one half because of the average um, E naught squared. Um, and the, and, uh, or we can clean it up just a little bit, or, or we can also use, say um, because the speed of light is squared is epsilon naught, one over epsilon naught mu naught, we can also write this as C epsilon naught over two E naught squared. Okay, 
So just to prove that the time average of sine squared is a half, because remember here we said that um, e is equal to e naught times the sine of a bunch of stuff. Um, so let me just do that here. Um, so if you've not run across this one before, the idea goes like this. If I'm averaging over, so say if I got sine squared of omega t, I want to find a time average value of that over, zil, over many, many cycles. The first thing I can do is I can observe that it's one half of the time average of sine squared of omega t um, plus sine squared of omega t. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And since these numbers are always positive, the time average of the sum will be the sum of the time averages. So this will be one half times the time average value of sine squared of omega t um, plus the time average of sine squared of omega t. But here's the thing. The sine function and the cosine function look exactly like each other, except they've been shifted by 90 degrees. So if we're averaging over complete cycles, the average of sine squared and the average of cosine squared are the same difference. Um, so we can write this as one half of sine squared omega t plus the time average of cosine squared of omega t. Well, again, because everything is positive numbers, oops, again, because everything is positive numbers, there's nothing to stop me from saying that the time average, the sum of the time averages is the time average of the sums. And we know that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we get that the average of sine squared, or for that matter, the average of cosine squared, is a half, as long as you're averaging over a complete number of cycles. Alrighty, but importantly, the intensity of the light is given by the average value of the pointing vector. So it's very handy. It tells us which way the light is propagating and how intense it is. So again, I will follow that through. We, since there is a power over an area here, a power, we remember, can also be written as a force times a velocity. So although it's a little sketchy um, there, there's a kernel truth to it. If our light is impinging on something, we could write that power as a force times the speed of light and take it from there. Um, and so when we do, we get that the pressure, so here I'll write pr that the light should exert a pressure. Um, so I'll call this P rad, and this is not a power here. The P before was a power, I'm sorry. That's why I'm explicitly labeling this P rad, so we know this is a pressure. So be equal to the force over the area exerted on something, and that will be equal to the intensity over the speed of light from what we had before. And also this just plain follows what we saw, for instance, with sound waves. We had exactly the same thing, and since it's obeying all the same math, that's true. So this would be true if our light wave is getting absorbed. And if it's getting reflected, then we would times that by two because the light wave is going to bounce back off. So the change in momentum was doubled. Um, so 
we get that. If it's absorbed, it's the intensity of the light over C, and if it's reflected, it's doubled that. So in this video right here, you are seeing a um, one of those little spinny things that you can pick up at science at the Science Museum gift store. Okay, that's exactly where I got this one. And there are lots of well-meaning third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers who have shown people these things and said that this is an example of radiation pressure. So here it's spinning around kind of quickly because it's a bright day, but here it's spinning around more slowly because the, you've got some uh, cloud cover over the sun, and so we can see the ro direction of rotation more clearly. Now, when you're looking at this, you should be able to observe that this could not possibly be an a, um, example of radiation pressure. Why is that? Pause the video and we'll get back to it. So, the reason why it can't be a um, demonstration of radiation pressure is because the light bouncing off the white side of the veins is exerting double the pressure of the dark side of the veins. But you're seeing it go around the opposite way of what you would think. What's actually happening is the sun is heating up the dark sides because the dark sides do a better job of absorbing light. And there is actually some gas in that tube and that's causing the uh, heating the gas on the black sides of the veins and so the gas um, that that's the gas on that side is uh, moving a little quicker and that bounces into the black sides of the veins to make it spin around the way you actually see it spinning but this is an interesting phenomenon and there is some uh, potential application for it um, as we are starting to think about becoming more of an interplanetary spacefaring civilization one of the big problems we have is the extreme energy cost of um, going between planets um, and so one of the thoughts is how would you say get supplies out to some distant space station where people are doing research or how would you get goods back from some colony or something like that? Well, if you're not in a hurry and you're willing to take years to do it, what you could do is make a very large sheet of aluminized mylar that will basically act like a sail. And you can use exactly the same techniques that sailors use, both to go downwind from the sun but also to tack into the wind um, go, um, heading towards the sun. Now, these voyages would take years, but if you're talking non-perishable supplies and you're just maintaining a constant uh, flow of them, it might be a way to go. Alrighty, so in the next video we will be taking a look at uh, polarization of light. Catch you over there.